Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest on the show today. She is an artist and author, and her name is Lori Cross. She's here today, and she has an amazing story to tell. She has a book that just came out, and you're going to love her. So I'm going to give the, 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 uh, the, I guess you could say, I'm going to give it all to her right now because I just want you to listen to her story because it's amazing. So, Lori, tell you, everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on, Stacey. I'm, uh, yeah, Lori Koss, a K-O-S-S, and I was born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, to parents who were the ultimate storytellers. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting and bizarre things happen in our lives, and I at some point decided I needed to uh, record those in a book, but I uh, had a really wonderful life growing up. Uh, mother, um, my parents are, I would say my parents are, they're still alive, and my mother's 87, and my dad 91, and their relationship is a real testament to the power of forgiveness, and that's a lot of what I explore in my book as well. Uh, but uh, when I was a young mother in the early 90s, my husband and I moved four hours inland to Kelowna, British Columbia. And it's a city that's a small, smaller city that's situated on a 100 um, mile long lake. And uh, we're very fortunate to live here with typical, what, you know, what's great about British Columbia, the mountains and the lakes and, and uh, nature at its finest. So uh, my children are grown now and my husband and I are still together. Thank goodness for forgiveness. We've learned it in our <laughs> as well. And uh, our children are grown. Uh, our son lives uh, just a few minutes away with his fiance. And our daughter lives in Seattle with her husband and our 18 month old granddaughter. Uh, so we're also grandparents, uh, which is pretty exciting. And I've had a, I've studied uh, at college and university, studied art and English, and have been a professional artist for about 20 years now with my working galleries. And um, that's sort of it in a nutshell to start, but there's, a, there's obviously a lot more to it. So, but, yeah. I'm really interested to learn about your book because you told me that a lot of the things in your book come from storytelling. Like you, you don't tell people what to do. You yep. basically, you speak from the stories in your life and they're very heartwarming stories and funny stories. And it's a combination, a little about everything. And you talk about intuition and you have like a lot of different things that are going on with the book. So I'd really like to learn more about the book and what was the purpose? Like what gave you the inspiration to write this book? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. Here's the book. So lessons learned from the short stories of my life. And all those icons are basically you know, little symbols of some of the stories in the book. Um, and each, the interesting thing about the book, it's quite a unique format. So each page is a single story. Wow. And each story, each story concludes with a thought-provoking or funny quote. So, oh, yeah. Wow. And so it's 515 stories. Wow. Um, yeah, so 515 pages, you know, and it, I, I guess for anyone who knows me well, it's not surprising I wrote a book. I studied English and writing when I was in university and I've always been a storyteller. <clears throat> you know, as I said, I was born into a family of storytellers. So we have a lot of material in our family. A lot of things have happened to us, uh, good and bad. And I wouldn't say bad, that's a judgment. I would say good and challenging yeah. uh, things that have helped us grow more um, for sure. But uh, when my daughter was about... I think she was about, about 10 years ago when she was in her early 20s. She said to me one day, mom, you've got to record our family stories. And I, I took that as she had faith in me that I was capable of recording the family stories. Um, and I wanted to do a good job of it. And I, I knew she was right. Like I knew that we had enough stuff that had happened in our lives as a family, but also to me personally, that they deserve to be record, recorded. But I didn't at the time think of them as individual stories. Yeah. I thought of it as the story of my life. Right. Which deserved to be recorded as, as everybody's does because we all have a story as they say, right? We all yeah. do. And so uh, I have had some peculiar things happen to me <laughs> that, that uh, I think are a little bit out of the ordinary. But um, anyway, so she had really planted this seed and I didn't do anything about it because I was painting full time at the, at, at the time. And, and she planted it again, you know, a couple months later. Are you recording our stories? Have you started? So finally, I decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to write a book. 
And the first thing I did is I got, I downloaded a free version of a, of a program and it divides everything. You can put it in chapters. And I spent a lot of time, far too much time organizing chapters and what would the chapter be called and la, 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 la. And then I started to write it and it was terrible. <laughs> and it was so humbling because I knew I was a good writer. Yes. But I didn't know what I was doing. Clearly, I was way over my head. And I, so I shelved it. Yeah. And of course, my daughter continued to, to um, ask me about it and try to convince me to keep going. And she's a fa fabulous writer herself, actually. And uh, she, my, our daughter ended up going to Harvard, which is one of my what is the chance stories, because we're just a small town in Kelowna. This is an aside, but a worthwhile aside. She was 12. She told us she was going to go to Harvard one day and we pat her on the head. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice idea. Good dream. You, you dream, girl. That's great. You know, and then she did. So her, she herself is a fabulous, amazing writer, very skilled. So she kept encouraging me, mom, you're a great writer. You can do this. I tried again. It was terrible again. And I gave up. So Sarah eventually gave me about seven or eight years ago, she gave me a book called Bird by Bird by Annie, I, I've written it down just so I don't forget the name, Bird by Bird by Annie Lamott. Mm -hmm. And it uh, it was about writing nonfiction. And it was very encouraging. So I read that. And then I read Stephen King's On Writing, which was mm -hmm. also an excellent book. And then I also read another book that Sarah gave me called On Writing Well by William Zinzer. Then I felt like, okay, now I've got the skills. I can do this. I tried it again. Nope. <laughs> Because what I was struggling with was how to link these stories together. Yeah. So what I did, and this sort of, this is part of the theme of my book, believing in my intuition. Um, I was definitely gifted with a very uh, strong, open intuition as a young child, which is all in part of the book. As, as I was saying to you earlier, I believe everyone has that same intuition, but some of us seem to block it with fear or yeah. not believing in it or not trusting it. Uh, so a lot of the journey in the book is about trusting the intuition. So anyhow, I decided that if I'm going to write this book, I'm going to follow my own um, beliefs and ideas, which is I can ask the universe for everything and I can be open to the answer. Yeah. So I went to bed one night and I actually said to my husband, OK, I'm going to figure out how to write this book tonight. I'm going to turn it over to the universe, God, Holy Spirit higher mind, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And I'm going to ask for guidance. If this book is supposed to be written, how should I write it? Right. So the story is in the book. I went to bed that night and I said, I did that exact thing. I said, what should I do? How, if you want me to write this, tell me how. And I had such a vivid dream and it was so clear and it was not my own idea. So I take no ownership for this idea. I asked and, and this idea was given to me and I even woke my husband up early in the morning and said, I know how to write my book. I'm going to start tomorrow. And that was about five or six years ago. I started the next day and I wrote every day until it was done. And it, I knew what I had to do. Thank you to the universe or whatever for, for showing me the way. Um, I dreamt of a one page story ending with a quote. And I've always loved quotes. I've been a collector of quotes. I've got five quotes on the wall in my art studio that I read every time I sit down to paint. Yeah. And I thought this is brilliant. This is exactly how I need to do it because if I were to link 515 stories together, the book would have been 17,000 pages long. Like there's right. just no way to do it. So to write them individually, but chronologically yeah. in my life was such an interesting way to write. And also limiting myself to one page per story meant that I had to be very concise with my writing mm -hmm. and not wordy. Right. So so did I, in a roundabout way, answer your question, Stacey? I think I did. Um, but anyhow, I think it was that it came to me in a dream, the one page, one story per page format, yeah. ending with a quote, and also prompted by my daughter. So that is basically how it came to be. And then I did work with a copy editor as well. And uh, I, I thought with my 500, I think I had 520 stories at the time, I thought she would probably cut 100 of them, and she cut five. So it ended up being 515 pages long. And what I'm hearing back from readers is, believe it or not, it's that some of them were sad when it ended, that they wished it were longer, which yeah. is, a, is a huge compliment. It so, is. Yeah. 
So that's basically, and, and I said, I, and what people are saying to me as well is they read a story and they intend maybe to read a couple of stories. They sit down, they read a couple of stories, but then they think, what is the next story going to be about? They turn yes. the page. What's the next story going to be about? So that's been kind of fun because <clears throat> people are, some people are reading it very fast and other people are reading, uh, treating themselves to a story a day. So yeah, it's yeah. Been, it's been a great format. And my, my goal, I think all along, and I, I hope this happens and actually hearing back from readers that it is, is that other people are inspired to write their own life stories in this format. I like it's that. Very accessible. Just record your stories. And if you only have 10 stories, record those 10 stories like this. Yeah. And the quote is, I had only one reader has said to me, they didn't think the quotes were necessary, which I thought was interesting because the quotes to me, sometimes the quotes highlight the lesson. Yes. You know, I, I don't agree. actually, I don't actually set out to tell someone what they should do. I'm not in a, I'm not a counselor or a life coach or I don't, I'm not here to give advice. I simply tell the stories. And if someone takes a lesson from that, yeah, then, then my book has succeeded. Right. And I am hearing back from people that they're learning things and looking at their lives differently because of the story. So that's huge. But yeah, so I, I encourage other people to maybe read the book and then be inspired to write their own stories down. And I think there's value in whether you've got 10 or 20 or 500, you know, but to write them down for, for yourself, for your, for your family, it's um, storytelling and connects us as a culture. And I think it's a lost art to some degree. And I, I hope that to bring it back um, with do my little part to bring it back and, and it connects us as a people, it connects generations. And so, yeah, that's what my book's basically about. And that's how it came to be. So, yeah. I love that. You know, I, I've written tw 20 books and I've never thought about writing one story at a time. I think that's a fabulous. I, I think it's really a unique way of writing a book. And I like it because it does give like a cliffhanger at the end. You know, it's like, what's next? What's next? You know, and I, I think that's fabulous because you have a fresh new story after each story. So yes. it's not ongoing and just dragging along. You have something brand new, you know, on each page. So a, a beautiful story that begins and ends and then something else begins and ends. Just like the concept of life. We begin and there's an ending and it's the renewal, the cycle of life, the beginning, the end, the beginning, the end. And I think because we're so used to that format in our own lives, the beginning, the end, the beginning, the end, it's kind of something that's just built in us that we kind of draws us to that, that format, you know, and, and I think it, I think it's a brilliant format that you did. Now you talk about intuition. Now, where does intuition play a part in this? Uh, yeah. So I actually, because there's 515 stories, I had to write down, um, to remind myself of where certain things are. <laughs> I can't have a table of contents. Think about a 515 stories. Uh, yeah. A table of contents would be like 20 pages long. Like, so I actually, you know, have written down a few things. Um, so yeah, the intuition, the first one, I don't know if I've got this written or it doesn't matter. I, I remember it's one of the first stories. It's like very early on. And my mother says, that this is the first time that she realized that I had some kind of unusual intuition. I, I think I was four at the time um, that my mother, my mother and father were trying to ignore, you know, mm -hmm. they would think something and I'd answer the question, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and the very, the one that they recall being the moment where they were like, okay, there's more to this. There's something going on here. This is definitely not, this is unusual now. And, and having said that, like I mentioned earlier, I don't believe it. This is something that I just happened to be lucky to be born with. It really is from my experience in everyone. Yes. But we do block people block it with fear. And I think one of the things my book has given people is the, and I've had heard this from readers. I've gotten letters, which just warmed my heart. You have given me permission to trust my intuition more. And I'm like, hallelujah, that's exactly one of the reasons I wrote the book. But the first time, the very first time was when I was four and my, I was coloring and I remember this and my mom was at the kitchen sink and I stopped coloring and I, I had this vision of my grandmother on the bus and I could see her reaching up to pull the string. I, I saw it and she was wearing a purple scarf and I said, oh, mom, mommy, mommy, grandma's coming to visit. She's and mom said, oh no, she's not. And I said, yes, yeah, she is. She's on the bus. She's going to stop by. And mom said, no, honey, she's not, grandma's not coming for visit, a visit. And then ding dong, 
and we go to the door and there's grandma. So I was just on the bus going by and I decided to stop for a visit. So that was the most clear kind of one that my mom, she couldn't argue with that. It was so clear. So yeah. that in strong intuition has followed me through my entire life. I will say that it has gotten dimmer, less accessible over the, as my mind got busier. Yes. So, and my mind got very busy into my, you know, into my twenties and thirties and life and children and that, and that was less accessible. But as I learned to calm my mind down and find quiet again, and, and I'm a yoga teacher as well, uh, a meditator as well. When I've been able to do that, the intuition has been more available again. Uh, I've never purposely tried to read someone's mind, but I have countless times had access to what someone I love or other people are thinking Yes, very clearly. And one that comes to mind that, you know, was, I couldn't, we can't, there's no way to explain this otherwise was when I was working, it, like if my, if I were very, very busy with focus is a better word, very focused on some other thing, the intuition seemed very available. Yes. If I were trying to figure out what someone's thinking or I would never do that to me that's an invasion of privacy and never has interested me at all yes and I certainly, I certainly would never call myself psychic or, or clairvoyant or anything like that I think we're all our minds are connected on mm -hmm. some level so all I'm doing is is I think all I have is some access open access like we all do um I have less blocks to you know perhaps but there was this time when I was in my late teens early 20s and I was working at exhibition park which in Vancouver that's the horse races I was a teller and I was very focused on what I was doing and I was you know like one pointed focus which is almost like a, con a type of meditation in a sense you're so focused and concentrated that my mind was I guess open and I started to hear a voice in my head of someone saying oh David oh David I love you so much and I'm thinking you know what is that but I finished what I was doing sat down in between the race with the people next to me that were also tellers. And I thought, who could be thinking about someone named David? And you know, clearly it wasn't the guy next to me. He had a girlfriend named, you know, and Sandra or something. And then the woman next to me was in a committed relationship with someone named Bob or whatever. And so this continued on until, you know, as we continued to work, the, the thoughts got more explicit and I really didn't want them in my head. And I just, I knew someone nearby had to be thinking it and yeah. I was picking it up. So I sat down in between races and I turned to the woman next to me and I said, who is David? <laughs> and she just went like white in the face. And she said she was she was in a long term lived lived with a fellow. Um, I can't remember his name, but no, but it doesn't matter. They lived together. I knew about yeah. that. He whispered to me, oh, my gosh, how do you know about David and me? It's she said, we're having an affair. He works on the second floor. And she said, nobody else. We've told nobody. What are you psychic or something? Because I don't believe in that. And I said, I bet you do now. <laughs> but that wasn't, like I said, I don't believe it's a psychic phenomenon. I think it's just being very open. Yeah. You know, all we all hear voices in our head, but we ignore that or ignore it, or, um, sorry, ignore it, or we um, say it's coincidence. You know, like you think of your friend and then they call and we think, well, what a coincidence. Yeah. I don't think it's a coincidence. No, I don't either. And I think that what the book has given people is that that permission, as somebody said, to believe in those moments where you think of somebody or you 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 think of a thought or something and, you, and someone else might be thinking that. And then you ask the question, your husband or partner says, oh, I was just thinking about that. Right. Like yeah. everybody has that. So therefore, I believe it's open to everyone. The difference is that maybe from a young age, because my parents, despite being Catholic and really a afraid of it at first in some on to some level to some degree they finally just welcomed it and yeah. accepted it and let it be what it was and right. so, you know to the point where my mom would when she wanted to call me home would in her mind go Lori come home Lori come home Lori come home and I come home I go what <laughs> why do you want me to come home so it actually has it's been something that she's we've used um you know in, in fun and and also never yeah. as a serious thing um, but also just a way to say this is available to everybody right and we need to open our minds more to it because we're all connected on oh, some level. 
A hundred percent. I think, I think everyone has the sixth sense. I call it, you know, like we all, we all can connect with our inner selves. We all have the ability to connect with our intuition and we can connect with others also. And, and if you think about it, we're all made of energy. The world is made of energy. We're made yes. of energy. And, you know, and if, if there was no energy, we wouldn't exist. And the same thing, if you go into a room and you're full of positive people, you're going to leave that room and you're going to feel charged up. Now, if you're in a room and no matter how nice the person may be, if they're negative and they're interacting with you, you're going to, you're going to leave the room and you're going to feel drained like a vacuum, just suck the energy out of you because yeah. it's the energy. We feel other energies. We can feel, we can bring in other energies. Our intuitions can feel the other energies that if we in tune ourselves, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, we're all connected. And, yeah. you know, everything that happens to us happens, I believe for a reason, you know, I, I, I really do. And I love the fact that you tell you, uh, you know, what is it? 504 or 514 stories, 515 stories. Yeah. 515 stories. I think that's amazing. I, I can't tell you that is just a, a brilliant idea because it's like, you know, sometimes you could read a story and, you know, sometimes the chapters could drag along a little bit, or sometimes you could lose interest or sometimes, you know, it's just so much content that it's overwhelming because the chapters are so long, but then when you get a book that has fresh content, like I mentioned earlier, and you new stories to venture on, I think that interests a lot of people. And not only are, is it entertaining, but you made it so people could actually learn and heal from it mentally. And I say physically because 70% of stress is caused by it causes illness you know that's mainly people get sick because of stress we just open our our immune system break down our doors open up and say come and get me you know so it's like when you can hear other people telling stories we learn from each other's stories that's why they have podcasts that's why they have talk shows that's why people do what they do because it's not so much telling people what to do it's telling stories and learning from each other's experiences i think what do yeah, you think I agree. And I think like the intuition one's interesting because I um I have used it to guide my life as well. What yeah. saying to the universe, God, Holy Spirit, love, power of higher mind, whatever you want to call that energy that's that we're all part of. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you're religious, God's a great name for it. Um, if you're not, then whatever speaks to you, because I think it's all different names for the same thing. I do um, too. Yeah, you know, and so I've used that intuition to be open to that guidance, mm -hmm. um, and people are learning from the stories that I'm telling throughout the book. So the, a lot of it is not just the woo woo ones, like I mentioned a couple, but more that that I how I use that guidance to say where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What mm -hmm. would you have me say and to whom? Like just ask constantly for guidance, and when I do that. And when I take that moment, that time to, to connect to whatever that is and to ask for that guidance and use my, and I, intuition sometimes isn't the best word, but that openness to the guidance maybe is a good way to look at it and to, to trust what you hear. Like, like the guidance comes in your own voice, in your mind, but you, it's there. If you listen, you mm -hmm. know, the, we know the answers. Our higher mind knows what's best yes. and not just best for us, but a win-win for all. Yes. And so, and who are we to think that we might know that win-win? We never do because we we can't see the whole picture. No. So trust that we'll be guided um, in the right way, win-win for all. And so I use that. And it has guided me in the most remarkable and unbelievable ways in my life. Like I've had things happen that I can't even believe. Like, so, th so yes, yeah, so the, the storytelling and the one story per page works will work to inspire people because there's going to be something that everyone or anyone can relate to. And if you don't like a story, turn the page. You literally spent one minute with it and that's it. Yeah. They take about a minute and 15 seconds to read, but there's something in there for everybody, which is cool. And if you, you never have to look back and go, what happened again? You can put it down for a month and pick it up and read it again. And the cool, I have people that are rereading it for the third time because mm -hmm. 515 stories are a lot to remember. So you forget a lot and you want to go back and reread yeah, it. Yeah. Right? But the intuition, you know, so the book really does talk about me on my spiritual path of realizing that that what well, we're not this body. We're yeah. so much more than this, right? Oh, I mean, I had, I had, yeah, I had something happen at age fifteen, which at the time was super weird. 
Um, I write about it, of course, in the book, but it was, it gave me a gift, a gift that I've taken with me ever since. And it, and it has led me down this path, really, that we are not just this body. This yeah. body is like a, a learning tool for us to use while we're here to evolve. And we're here to evolve and grow better than we were when we came, like to evolve and improve our former selves, not improve ourselves compared to others ever. Just always, how can we learn and grow and evolve in this lifetime, you know? And it's like life, the world is like a, is like a, our classroom, you know? And other people are like our teachers because they, they annoy us and frustrate us and we can learn how to deal with that and how to handle it. Um, and evolve that way and through forgiveness and so on. But um, but the book, the thing that happened when I was 15, which set me on this path of believing that we're more than our bodies. And it's never happened since. I don't know why it happened that one day, but I was with some friends. We're sitting around in a circle. It was like, you know, spring. Was, I remember the, the pavement was warm and we were sitting there. It was in the early evening, um, but light out, very light out, uh, like a June day or something. And there's about a dozen, a dozen of us sitting cross-legged in a circle. And all of a sudden, in a split second, I was looking down at the circle. And I could see my body sitting there. I was very separate from my body, but I could see it sitting there. I was kind of, you know, just leaning over. And if people were talking and no one knows that maybe I looked like I was dozing or something, but I was up above and I looked down. The first thing that I realized once I was above was that I could go higher and I, I remember looking at a tree. I don't know why. I just suddenly, the bark on the tree looked beautiful. And I remember just seeing that and then looking back down. I never felt afraid. I never felt like I had died. I just felt free and full of so much joy and so alive. And I looked back down and I remember thinking later, I could see, but I, my eyes were down in my body. Mm -hmm. Like, and I could think and process, but my brain was down in my body. And it was so bizarre. And I, as I, I went higher, and as I went higher and the group grew smaller, I thought, they're never going to believe me. I had that thought up there that they're not going to believe this happened. And I remember looking around and I saw the top of the school. We we're next to our school, um, the mid, uh, like a high school, our high school. And I could see on the roof, there was a, a, a cone and a pair of running shoes tied together I think in a ball and a couple items and I memorized them and I I started this is cool like look at this view I'm getting of North Vancouver you know and then yeah. in, a, in a second someone was I, I was looking at a friend and she was shaking me she goes did you fall asleep and I said no I went I just was up there and it was the most bizarre thing and a couple people in the group thought it was cool the rest kind of like you had a dream, you know, whatever. Like an out of body experience. I did. I've never had one since. It was the only time. And looking back, like I said, it was a gift to me because I knew it. I knew without a doubt, we are not this body. Yeah. And so, but what happened was on the Monday, I went with a couple friends and we got the janitor to go on the roof and he brought down exactly what I said had been there. How else could I have ever known what was on the roof of the school? Yeah. So it was pretty much proof right? Right. And it really affected me at that age to just to just know that we're so much more. And I think my it really informed my life, probably, you know, so so that kind of thing. But overall, you know, the book at, at the end of the day is still just a person who happens to be an artist, who got married, had some children, has some cute stories around that. Um, and then went on a spiritual journey. Uh, you know, I, I will say that my spiritual journey has been, um, a lot of it's been due to the experiences I've had. Like we're all the sum of our learned experiences, right? So I've been, you know, moving in this direction. But my parents, I have to give a lot of credit, if not all the credit to them. My mom is a recovered alcoholic who found a spiritual path back in the 80s that she committed to, which I thought was hogwash, honestly, at the beginning. But I saw a change in her and saw just an amazing transformation that to yeah. this day has existed and continued. Uh, she's never missed a day of reading. And, and the book is called The Course in Miracles. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Mm. Um, you know, there's many, many paths to the same goal. This just happens to be one of them. Yeah. You know, that path being peace of mind and, and uh, evolving and growing and, and learning. Um, this happens to be one of them. 
And it's the one that I finally, you know, after seeing the change in my parents, both of my parents and realizing that, you know, they they have grown and learned and changed so much, so dramatically that there's something to this way of thinking. Yeah. And basically, um, it's a spiritual study course that is essentially um, about learning to change your mind through the power of forgiveness and, you know, using your relationships to do so. So that's it in a nutshell. And uh, so I'm grateful to my parents for getting me on this path as well. But they didn't get me on it by telling me to do it. They got me on it by living it. Yeah. And that's what my book is. I'm not, I'm not telling people you should do this, that, or the other thing. I'm not in that position to do that. That's not my role. I can tell you how to paint. Yeah. I give lots of advice about that, but I, but I don't give any advice about life. I simply live. This is how I live my life. These are the lessons I learned. These are the things I experienced. And if you take something from it, great. And, you know, one example, which I think is one of the best examples in my book, and I've had countless people mention this one story that happened just a few years ago. Um, this is a, this this one ex- sort of shows how I tell a story that someone can take a lesson from. Yeah, I'm not preaching or telling, giving me advice. Like I said, I just simply had this happen to me. So my husband and I go to Starbucks. Mm-hmm. It's like four, three, four years ago, and. And it was before the pandemic. So probably just before the pandemic. Right. And he went in to get a coffee. And when he came out, he said, you're not going to believe it. I got my coffee for free. And I said, why? And he said, well, when the baristas arrived at work that morning, it was like, you know, they arrived really early, 435, whatever. They decided, they made a pact that they were going to give a free coffee to the first person to say please and thank you. And my husband was the first person to say, please and thank you. And it was 1.30 in the afternoon. And by the time he said, please and thank you, the first person in Starbucks for how many hours, they were practically depressed by humanity. And so he says, please and thank you. They practically cheer. They're so excited. They <laughs> free coffee. But when he came back to the car, we're like, why don't people say please and thank you? Yeah. And so I've had more people say to me, I say please and thank you in Starbucks now. <laughs> yeah. And it, but if they take that and they take it into the rest of their lives. Yes. It's about being polite and courteous, but it's more than that. It's about being present. Yes. And being in the moment enough to be aware that somebody is giving you something. Say thank you. Exactly. You no, know, it's not about the other person. It's about us. Yes. And what we learn by what we give, we get. Exactly. All all we give is given to ourselves. So if we give love, we get love. Right. If we, you know, if we give whatever we give out into the world, if we give hatred, we'll get hatred back. Yeah. You know, so I think a lot of it is, is that's the kind of thing that the the lessons are like. It's just a story. Yeah. You know, so, and, and what you take from it is your business. I agree with you. yeah. Yeah. I think, I think in our society, people have gotten so involved with themselves, me, 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 me. That, and, this. and then, yes. And social media and, and being on the phone all the time that they, they, they've lost a, a lack of respect in our society. We, we have, we don't have as much, you know, thoughtfulness and respect. We have lots of great people in this world. Don't get me wrong, but you know, I don't see people exemplifying courteousness like they used to, you know? I see a lot of selfishness and, and, uh, and, you know, people have to really take a step back and, and really, you know, think about giving and gratitude and kindness and love, you know, the powerful words that need to be utilized more in our society. Yeah, And I think, I think that that's exactly right. We, we, it's because we're lack. I think it's, it's, it helps us to gain awareness. And if we have awareness, we can change. Yes. If we take a moment to even do something as simple as change that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You have to be aware enough in that moment to do it. And if you're developing awareness in a moment like that, just something simple as picking up a coffee, you can take that awareness and develop and bring it into the rest of your life. Yeah. And I do think we need to develop more awareness if we're going to evolve. Yeah. You know, that that's what it comes down to. I had a friend years ago who wanted this actually, this is in the book too. She very, very intelligent, probably the most intelligent woman I've ever met. She's a family doctor, amazing person, but she so I want what you have. You have a lot of joy. And, and by the way, joy is our natural state. Yes. And we 
block joy with fear, in my opinion. No, I agree with you. Fear. So we, if we can remove those blocks of fear, we can be, be joyful. It's how we're supposed to be. Yeah. But I want what you have. And I want to get on the same path and I want to learn. And I want to grow. And I want to, I want to have that voice that guides me. I want to trust that. And I said, yes. the first thing you need to do is develop awareness. You're mm-hmm. going to, you can't actually make the change without awareness. It's just like mm-hmm. an alcoholic can't become sober if they don't have the awareness that their life would be better without alcohol. Exactly. Have that awareness and to change their mind. And the the book I mentioned, A Course in Miracles, which we follow, which is not for everybody, but it a miracle is simply a change in your way of thinking. It's yeah. about changing your mind. And you know, and and basically if we are able to be aware enough, we can change our minds and how we interact with people, how we interact with ourselves, how we interact with you know, our higher, higher power, whatever that might be. And so to me, that's what it's really all about. And uh, yeah, so I don't know where else I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you had to take um, from everything we discussed today, if you had to take a couple of takeaways that you want to emphasize to the listeners, what would you emphasize? Uh, I think that I hope that what my book achieves uh, in people's lives is not only entertainment, because I, I, we haven't even touched on the fact that it is hilariously funny. I will, I don't toot my own, own horn very often, <laughs> but I will say that I I can write in a very amusing way. And I've had some hilariously funny things happen to me. And I've had readers say, your book is laugh out loud funny, like literally laughing my head off when I read it. Yeah. So that, which balances nicely with the rest of it, right? So I would say if you want, like that my book will entertain you, um, it will guide you in a self-help way where you're reading a memoir and you don't realize you're actually reading self-help because it will present you with opportunities to change your mind, to look at life differently, to open up your your idea to what life could really be about and why we're here. Yeah. And follow your intuition or your higher guidance, whatever that might be for you. And I hope that readers um, not only enjoy it as a journey and, uh, you know, my life has given me lots of reasons to write. So mm-hmm. Be amused, be amazed, be wonder about, you know, we had, I lived in a house that was like haunted at one point and we can't explain it. So read about that and wonder yourself, you know, but more importantly, I think what I would love the takeaway would be that people get inspired enough to record their own stories. I think that's the biggest takeaway for me that I, this idea for a one story per page did not come from me. I asked for it. I was given a gift and I want to share it. Yes. Not, not just in the way that I'm sharing my book, but sharing that idea of people writing their own stories down. Right. Storytelling, it, like we said earlier, it, it connects us all. And there's just so much value in it, you know, through the generations as well as just from person to person. So right. that, would, that would be basically what I would hope, you know. I love people- it. Now, tell me about your website, because you have your book on your website, but you also are an artist and you have all different types of arts as well on your. Yes, yes. I actually um, I'm a professional artist. Uh, I've had my work. Actually, you can see them. I can turn this slightly. I've had my work on uh, Canada Post stamps. Uh, So those that was a bizarre story, too. And then I've also had my work on a Canadian uh, Royal Canadian Mint coin, uh, which is also a very cool story. I'm going to leave that one for the readers because my daughter is involved in that. She had a dream when she was a child about a coin. Anyways, good story. Uh-huh. Um, so I have my work on a coin. Um, but what I do is, as a professional artist is I paint very large flowers, um, flowers close up, very intimate, uh, very in, sort of inspired because I really will not paint if I'm not feeling love, if that makes sense. If I'm, in, mm-hmm. if I'm feeling any kind of unrest or... Um, pressure or I'm feeling and I have enough awareness to realize I'm feeling that I won't paint yeah I'll find out why I'm feeling that way and and clear it before I paint so every painting I just feel really comes from almost like the paintings come through me yeah Um, I I've worked hard I I don't want to you know lighten that too much I've worked really hard at my career but oh yeah uh, also feel that turning it over and reading these quotes that are on my on my um studio wall the first one is art must be an expression of love or it is nothing yeah. and that's by um mark chagall who's a very well-known artist and if i create from the heart nearly everything works if from the head almost nothing yeah. that's also mark chagall and those are both 
quotes that you could apply to life, right? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. So I'm very inspired by the beauty of flowers because I believe in um, the, just being inspired by nature. Yeah. Just authentic, and so I'm inspired by nature through the beauty of flowers, and I express on a very large canvas. I just finished one. You want to see? I would love to see it. Yes. I think I don't know if you can see it in the in the. <gasps> oh, that is so beautiful. I love it. Yeah. So that's one of the paintings I just recently completed. But um, I also do a lot of very colorful paintings um, of dahlias that I just finished, a, one that's just really lit from back behind that I quite like too. So yeah, so I'm an artist primarily, but um, yeah, and I was saying before, people that knew me, know me well are not surprised I wrote a book. Yeah. But people that don't know me well, that see me just as an artist, some of those people have been very surprised I've written a book. And I haven't got the warmest reception from some of those people, which has been very fascinating to watch. Yeah. You know, it's like I've been, I've been pinholed in as an artist. Yeah. How can you also be an author? <clears throat> so I had one person say to me, I really didn't want to read your book. I didn't think you could write if you're an artist, you, you should, you know, but I decided to read it and you, but yeah. art, but writing is a form of art. It is, it is. And, but this person, but their feedback was, I was really surprised that you can actually write too. And I said, well, I worked hard. They didn't hear the story about all the books I read and all the 10 years of trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah. But, yeah. But no, the art is my primary, is my main career. Um, but I have to say, after writing 515 stories, my writing really improved. <laughs> it does. The more and practice go, you get. I had to go back and rewrite the first 200 stories completely because um, because my writing had improved that much. And so I'd like to keep writing. I, I it is a form of art, like you said, Stacy, and uh, I really enjoy it. And obviously, you've written a lot of books, so you find a lot of um, passion from that, too, I'm sure, from writing. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And it is a form where you go deep into your heart and your your heart speaks to you and you just put it on paper, just like, you know, your heart speaks to you, but then you're putting it on a canvas. So it, it's yeah. really it's 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 a different process, but it has the same concept in a sense. Yeah, and I think people can be more than one thing. Oh my God, yes. I mean, my husband's a family doctor, but he's also a musician, you know, and yeah. there's facets to all of us. And I do put my 10,000 hours in for all of these things I do though. So it's not like it just comes to me. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I've had over 400 episodes and I, you know, there are people who wear seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hats, you know, and they just, it's just, you know, you don't, you're not, you're not bound to one thing in life. You know, we have talents in all different areas and I think we should let those talents shine. I agree. And I actually think that the clearer we get within ourselves, the more work we do on ourselves to, you know, rid ourselves of unforgivenesses and grievances and, and open our hearts and minds, the more creative, the more the creative flow that we get. Oh, a hundred percent. Sorry. When people are amazed that I'm able to do the painting and the work and, you know, how, how do I find the time and that I think what it is, is that I'm not bogged down by unforgivenesses and grievances and, yes. and, and, excess chatter in my head yes Lock, it blocks that creative flow oh 100 blocks that inspiration and so i would say to anyone who is out there and wants to be successful in in the creative field work on yourself first yeah like, work on yourself to clear all that stuff that is bogging you down all that negativity does not work well in the arts i mean it just mm. it, if you want to I really believe the arts are inspired, whether it's dance or, you know, writing or whatever. And if you're tight with and you're bogged down with all that negativity, it will not flow well. So to get it open, you've got to you got to do the personal work, too. And I think that's a great that, that what you just said is fabulous, because it's not just even in the creative world, in life itself. Yes. How do you grow as a person? If you're bogged down by negativity and you're bogged down by, you know, constant clutter in your brain about things that don't even matter anymore, but yet they're just cycling in your brain over and over and over again, wasted energy. And how do you grow as a person? How do you become the ultimate you, the best version of yourself, if you focus on things that aren't constructive? If you just let it go and you focus on that, your heart and what you love, You'll, you'll excel to any lens in life. 
Yeah, and I, I think that find your path. Like I like I said, that I think I believe there are many paths to that same goal of self-improvement, self-awareness. Some people it's yoga, some people it's maybe it's whatever, Bible or Quran yeah. or whatever. I don't know all the different disciplines, but you know, find yourself onto some path that helps you gain awareness and self-improve, become self-aware, self-improve and for, forgiveness to me is the key. Forgive yeah. yourself for your thoughts, forgive others and just clear your mind of all that garbage yeah. and just be present. You know, there's a reason the now is called the present. It's like a gift to us, right? Like to yeah. be fully present. And I read somewhere, it said, if, it, if the thing is not in, in front of you right now, why are you thinking about it? Right. And so that gaining awareness just around that little thing for me was, was huge because, you know, you blow drying your hair or you're driving the car and your mind is somewhere else. Yeah. Why? Why? Exactly. And if you learn to focus on what's right in front of you and stop thinking about the past, worrying about the future or regretting the past and all that stuff that takes you out of the present yeah. and you stay very focused and present, you, it's amazing what you can do. And it's amazing the joy you can feel. Yeah. Joy is natural, but we block it and we, and, and we can unblock it. And that's, that's part of the message in the book is just I love it. my own experiences because I, yeah, I've had some tough stuff happen. I, I, I had every reason. I know we probably need to um, end this soon, but there's a section in the book about, I had a very serious health issue and mm -hmm. I won't get into the details except that I went fully deaf in my left ear and ended up bedridden for months. But anyways, that story, I was really challenged to apply my path yeah. during that. So it's not like everything has just been golden for me. Yeah. Challenges too. And able to use that self-improvement, self-awareness work during a really difficult time too. So, you know, cause I know people have a lot of challenges out there. I know it's not easy, like, yeah. not, but these tools will he help when things are bad too. So. I love it. I love it. Now, where can people find your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. So amazon.com or amazon.ca. Uh, it's also on Barnes and Nobles, but everyone seems to go to Amazon these days. Yeah. Uh, I would appreciate reviews. I, I've, I've had 26 reviews so far and I've got five stars and which is great. And um, yeah, so you can find it there. You can go on my website as well, lauriecost.com. So L-A-U-R-I-E koss.com uh it is available to buy through there but it's it makes more sense to buy it through amazon to be honest and unless you want a signed copy in which case i can send you a signed copy <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah and then there are some local booksellers in our town that carry it as well but um i haven't gotten into any big chains or anything like that because i decided that if i'm going to live my life trusting and, and in faith, I'm going to trust that the book will find its way into the hands of people that need it the most. Right. I, because I really believe I've done a lot of reading in my life. I believe that you, a very a poorly written book can be marketed to become a, almost a bestseller, a very successful yes. and wonderful books don't ever make it there because they're, they're not marketed. <clears throat> so I don't I didn't want to market the heck out of it to prove that it was great. Yeah. I want people to find it and it's it is it's selling and people are buying it word of mouth and I'm getting great feedback and that's all that matters to me and that's wonderful that's a wonderful now with your website do you have any services or do you just you, you sell your artwork on your website and you sell your book yes. or? my work could be anyone can contact me if they have any interest in my artwork for sure I do some prints but I'm very limited in the prints I do I'm currently running a fundraiser um, I run one almost every year. Um, this one's going to hospice. Uh, I take one of my pansy. Um, I know that you, some of your readers, some of your listeners won't be able to see this, but this is um, oh, one's pretty. Watching. This is um, one of my pansies from my pansy show of 2017. And I uh, take one every year and rename it after somebody in my life. This one was renamed after a friend. My, her name is Margaret. So it's now called Margaret's Flower. She passed away last fall. Mm, and so um, renamed in her honor. And then uh, the prints are sold and 100% of proceeds go to a hospice. Um, some of them are um, other ones from previous years go to cancer research or what have you. So those are available. The prints, um, 
there is one canvas print that's available on there. So some things. Um, I'm also very active on Instagram. So Lori Costs Art on Instagram. I, um, I do put up videos that people really love of how to mix color and mix paint. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's one that, in fact, I'm probably going to do more of those because they seem to get the most views and the most interest. I had one I posted just a couple of weeks ago that's had 1.8 million views, which just boggles my mind that that many people are interested. But well, interesting yeah. Interesting me when you, when you mentioned it. Yeah. Because it's not and, uh, very easy to do if you don't know how to do it. Right. And so I have some skill in that area and, and a lot of practice. And so that's one thing that I do try to post on the first Tuesday of the month on Instagram, some kind of tip about uh, paint mixing. But otherwise, yeah, there's a blog, but I haven't uh, written anything recently on that. I've been too busy writing your <laughs> book. Just, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, that's basically where they can find me. And anyone can contact me if they're interested in more information about the book or any of my artwork as well. So. And do you have a newsletter that people can? I do. I do. I have a. I have a newsletter. It's um. I just I send it out on the first of the month. And I have quite a growing newsletter uh, following. I do like to give little gifts to my followers, um, the newsletter followers. So every once in a while, I'll, I'll do a draw and send out something. I've got one coming up. For next month, I'll be sending out these acrylic pens to three different people who follow me. Oh, nice. Who are part of, join my VIP list, as I call it, um, newsletter. So thanks for asking about that. I, I should have mentioned it, but yeah. So if you join my newsletter, I uh, will send you, oh, I don't inundate you with anything. Just one newsletter a month. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This has been amazing, Laurie. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been, I, I really enjoyed having you on the show. You have so many different, you know, stories and different things to really tap into that I think are very meaningful and that could help a lot of people. So I, I really appreciate the time that you shared with us today to talk about a lot of different subjects that are very, I think that are very meaningful and, and, and helpful to, to a lot of people in our world. You know, a lot of us, you know, we, we have, we all have, you know, our lives, but there's always parts of our lives that need a little bit of sculpting. And, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to have, you know, especially a book like yours, where you have different stories, and you make it it's a learning experience, but it's a fun learning experience. And there's different areas, you're not talking about one subject, you have lots of different stories with lots of different underlining meanings and, and helpful hints in each of them. So I really, you know, congratulate you at, you know, all the work you put into that book. It took you 10 years. You know, I really, I know that's, that's dedication. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I could write a book and they throw something together real quick, but that's not quality. You know, you took your time, you made it, you know, as best as you could possibly make it and it's meaningful and you can see the results. And I commend you for that. I really do. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Stacey. <clears throat> and thank you so much for having me on. It was fun. Oh, you're very welcome. And you have a great day. You too.